we talked a lot about the fact that Fanon was in many ways a, a visionary and that is still very relevant today, but it would not give an accurate um, depiction of a book if we just talk about that because Chaz also does a good job exactly. of talking and about Exactly, and you mentioned during yeah. the talk that it was in many ways a critical account of Fanon's ideas and politics. Hello and welcome to EY Conversations, the podcast. In this podcast, we will zoom in on the first EY Conversations event, which took place on October 3rd at the EY. This series is dedicated to engaging members of the EY community and the broader public with distinguished intellectuals on the ongoing global crises that shape our societies and politics. The inaugural conversation was between EY history professor Nicolas Guillot, who was joined by research fellow at Sciences Po, Dr. Nadia Marzuki, together with U.S. editor of the London Review of Books, Adam Schatz, for a discussion on Schatz's latest book, The Rebel's Clinic, The Revolutionary Lives of Franz Fanon. Joining us in this podcast digest is Gilles Delaine Atibio, researcher at the UI's Law Department, and Artur Banazuski, researcher at the UI's History Department, who will take a deep dive into this first conversation exploring Franz Fanon's revolutionary legacy. This book is not merely a biography of Fanon. It's, a, it's a, in a sense, a collective biography of a whole range of thinkers, um, activists, militants, philosophers, poets who were thinking about the same set of questions, um, namely, uh, well, one, how do, we, how do we overcome colonialism? Did you like yesterday's event? Yes, very much so. Very much more than I would have thought. Since it's a new format at the EUI, I did not expect anything. I really went with an open mind and I was really blown away by everything we talked about. And I think the event could have been longer and I would have enjoyed every minute of it. What about you? Same. I wished the event was longer because the book by Adam Schatz, it's so magnificent. It's not just a biography of Fanon, but it's a portrait of a generation of thinkers and uh, an important historical moment, which I think makes it so captivating we could debate it for hours. Schatz mentions names we both know and names we have forgotten. Mm -hmm. So I think it's really good because it con it contextualizes Fanon in a, in a time in a which historical time, right? The fifties, the sixties. You have the decolonizations. You have freedom. I mean, all this time for anti-imperial um, struggles, freedom fighters, and lots of writers were also activists. So it's really good. I really enjoyed the way he brought all of this together. Definitely, and it's a historical moment that keeps resonating throughout our contemporary time and contemporary political problems. And I think what the book uh, does excellently is to show how Fanon is an absolutely central figure to the debates about decolonization. Yeah, I think at some point, Chad says something about the fact that, you know, it was not the only one, there are a lot of people like that, but the, but the good thing that Fanon does is um, the way he makes a reader into a revolutionary, and that's probably why today is still very popular among so many people and the youth. Let's listen from Adam Schatz in the live event. Will colonialism produce these spectral effects? Will it last? Will it outlast its own life? Um, how do we recreate the world? How do we how do we reimagine politics in the aftermath of colonialism? Fanon was certainly one of the most creative thinkers to address these problems, and he was arguably the one thinker who could turn readers into revolutionaries. That's why we remember him. People read Fanon and they wanted to go out and fight. Uh, that's one of the reasons why he remains so popular, especially with young people. Uh, because he's very... I think we talked about that after the event, and you mentioned that it's an, I mean, it's a utopia, but to me, it's also very pragmatic, and so it gives the keys on so many things, and it asks a lot of questions, and some of them st seem still relevant today. So I really enjoyed the way uh, Schatz brought put that together, and the names he keeps on mentioning. For example, um, so you have. Um, the, Algerian context, but also mm -hmm. then the French continental context, but it also makes links with sub-Saharan Africa and, you know, all the 
the, f- yes. the struggles for decolonization, but also America and, for example, you know, the Black Panther. So I really enjoy that because we tend to forget about, you know, this time and all the links and the fact that all of this were connected. And the fact that it could be read and understood by people in so many different places Mm -hmm. facing um, such diverse yet similar struggles and problems. I think that's one of the reasons why Fanon is still widely read and admired. But at the same time, what makes Fanon so central as a political thinker is his, uh, was his ability to admit to the shortcomings of his theory and theories and writing. Uh, As Schatz Riley mentioned in his talk, Fanon never gave uh, easy answers. He was asking questions. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and yeah, and I think at some point Schatz says um, that it would be a disservice to Fanon for us to think, oh, you know, we, we want the answers, easy answers, and then we go with him. When we read Fanon, we uh, we uh, we make him we 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 err if we read him in a liturgical fashion, if we read him as someone who is presenting us with a set of answers. But it's mostly like you said about the questions and questions that are still relevant today. And you know, even when we were saying that you know Fanon can be read and understood in many contexts, and I think even beyond that, what he would have thought. It's also very interesting to talk about the fact that maybe it's also sometimes misunderstood or, you know, simplified. Fanon wrote what are essentially pamphlets, as Marie-Jeanne Manuelin would say. She found it to be quite amusing that people would read uh, The Wretched of the Earth or, or L'Enceinte, La Révolution Algérienne as f- philosophical texts. And I'm thinking here, you know, of a famous preface by, by Sartre and on the understanding of what Fanon means by violence. You know, um, so Sartre wrote this preface that seems to romanticize Fanon. And the sad thing is that many people encounter Fanon through Sartre because Sartre is more of a mainstream writer, especially in the or West. was at the time. Right? And even today, I guess it's a big name because for us, uh, I guess it would be interesting to like to tell how we encountered uh, Fanon. We talked about that, you and I, um, after the event. But for example, for me, I think I... The first time I heard about Fanon, I was probably 12 or 13, but because I was interested in, in all these questions, you know, being French and being Congolese, uh, I had never learned about Fanon in school, but then I tried to read him when I was in high school. It was a complete failure. <laughs> um, really? Too complicated. I, I, I tried to read Black Skin's White Mask, and then I tried again a few years later when I was in my bachelor, a bit more mature, and I only read The Wretched of the Earth last year. But to be said that to me, Fanon has always been a famous name, a reference. But then when I talk to other people, to friends who, you know, who grew up in the West and who have had a classic education, for many of them, they don't know Fanon or they knew about him very late. So I find it very contrasting, you know, the fact that for so many people is a reference and for others is not. Or they learned about about him full over, like, full over people like Sartre and then maybe they get a warped vision of who he was and what he represented. That's a fascinating story because I can speak from the perspective of someone for whom Fanon wasn't a reference point until very recently because I'm from Polish. I graduated from uh, the University of Warsaw and uh, there Fanon wasn't an assigned reading as far as I remember. I only first encountered him at the University of St. Andrews where I studied global social and political thought with uh, a wonderful program with a massive emphasis on post-colonial, post-colonial studies and thought. And there it was an illuminating moment in the sense that I r- discovered a strand of thought that I wasn't fully aware of previously uh, that explained a lot to me, explained what was happening in the not only in 20th century history, which I study, specialize in, but also in our contemporary matters. And that's why talking about Fanon and reassessing his contemporary legacy, as Schatz does in his excellent book, is such a crucial task. Yeah, no, definitely. And, you know, and these different stories of encounters, I think, tells a, 
tells us a lot about you know what we're coming from, like our standpoint, because we tend to think of reading as something neutral uh, and objective when our past history really informs what we're we going to read and how are we going to encounter them, other reference or not. And I'm thinking here at some point during the yesterday during the event, uh, I had I, I raised one question because of something. Um, Vio said, uh, so Professor Guillaume, about, you know, negritude uh, not being right. such a central movement anymore and, you know, like blackness is more central. And I, for me, I had to push back on it because it really depends on who you are, what's your perspective, what, from which point of view are you reading that? And for example, from someone like me who had who studied black studies and Afri you know, African studies, we had professors who specialized in African studies. Yeah. The negritude, even in the way we talk about blackness today, informs that. And it, of course, not everyone thinks that Sangor or Césaire are... We do not necessarily agree with everything they said, but whether or not you agree, you always... Like, your position is informed by their position. Even when you there's a pushback against Sangor, for example, is because you've read him. So it's it's still a reference. So for me, it was very interest, important to remind people that, you know, what you deem as a classical, what you deem as a mainstream is really informed by your positionality. Um, and your relationship with Fanon is also in that way informed by that because I, I have the impression, but it's actually true, that Fanon has been rediscovered for the past few decades in continental Europe because he, for a long time his books were banned in France and because I think France never quite forgave, forgave Fanon for you know positioning himself with Algeria. Let's listen to Nicolas Guillaume, Gilles Delaine, Ati Bio, and Adam Schatz from the live event. You do an amazing job at bringing back to life a, a bygone era of anti-colonial thinking you know, uh, concepts such as negritude are reconstructed, and he's a critique of that. And what's surprising, when you read the book, you realize how different it was back then. Uh, some of these concepts of, or ideas have just, you know, disappeared. Negritude is not something we talk about. We talk about blackness, which is not the same thing, actually. Correct me if I'm wrong, but at some point you were saying that uh, movements like la negritude right now are not that red anymore, that people like Sangor are not that relevant for the youth today. Uh, and I just wanted to push back against that because uh, in my world, there are always still references. I did black studies, African studies, and I had professors who were doing African studies. And they, they are still, even if when we talk about blackness today, their work inform the, the work around uh, blackness. And I ju I'm just saying it because I think it's really important to say wh from where we're talking, uh, we're talking, because we risk then rep repeating um, Eurocentric, um, uh, Eurocentric things. And in the same way that Fanon was quote unquote rediscovered in the last few decades in, in Europe, when it was always relevant on American campuses, especially among black students. So I just wanted to say that because we tend to make general remarks when it's very important to, to state from where we're talking from. I appreciate, I appreciate that comment. And I think actually you're referring to something that Nicola said, not that I said, because I, I actually would never argue that Sangor, Césaire, and the French thinkers of Negritude have ceased to be important. They're, 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 they remain hugely important. Um, absolutely, um, and uh, uh, I write about Césaire, Sangor, and, and Léon Gontran Damas um, uh, with great respect and admiration um, in this book. Um, in no way do I think that, uh, that the question of negritude is historically obsolete, not at all. And in fact, if you, uh, if you read uh, the work of, of uh, French black writers today, whether they're in France or they're uh, writing in, in, in francophone countries, uh, there, are, there remain very important references to, to Songor and to Césaire, who are, of course, you know, very, very different. Um, Schatz mentions that in his book. Yes, uh, but for like, people in formerly colonized uh, countries, people who were involved in, you know, in 
struggles for liberation. And in Amer Black American campuses, informed, you know, by the by the Black Panthers, Fanon has always been a reference, you know. So I just want to say that it sh we should be wary of making very universal claims, you know, about who's a reference and who's not, because your positionality and your history is going to inform, you know, who you consider a reference or not. Fanon was rescued from oblivion uh, by black Americans um, in the late 1960s. Uh, he was, you know, of course, translated into um, English in the mid-60s, first Wretched of the Earth and Black Skin, White Masks, and he was read by black psychiatrists um, who were interested in questions of what was then called black rage and also of the complexities of, of uh, and, and, and challenges experienced uh, by black students in predominantly white schools because Fanon had, 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 had written extensively about that in Black Skin, White Mass. But it was also the Black Panthers. You know, the Black Panthers, and there's this myth about the Black Panthers. Um, and the myth goes like this, that somehow uh, Fanon was appealing to them because he believed in armed struggle, because it was all about, you know, picking up a gun and shooting the pigs, and, and that's true. I mean, you know, there, there's a truth to that myth. You know, Fanon was a kind of French Malcolm X, and that's one of the reasons he was uh, so appealing to people like Eldridge Cleaver and, and, and Huey Newton. But another reason that, that Fanon was important to the Panthers, which is overlooked, uh, is that he brought to bear his psychiatric expertise and insight to the question of racism and the lived experience of being a racialized person in a racist white majority society. I think that's an extremely valuable point and one in which Fanon's thought is um, provides relevant insights in so far as he was very honest about the potential pitfalls and dangers of his political project and Schatz discusses it very beautifully. It's a wonderful book not because not only it shows a certain generation of radical thinkers but also it's a narrative of ideas. Schatz wonderfully summarizes what uh, Fanon wrote and even dedicates an entire chapter to the wretched of the earth. And Unlike his, uh, some of his uh, later followers and admirers, Fanon never dismissed the potential dangers of the national bourgeoisie in post-colonial countries, of the Western legacies that could be prolonged rather than creatively transformed in post-colonial societies. And emphasizing this aspect of Fanon's thought is critical to sustaining its uh, relevance. And, you know, at some point, Schatz says that, you know, that the book is a manifesto, but it's also a book about, you know, the future and possibilities. And there are a lot of propositions in that. Uh, and in this way, um, I find it very, yes, very interesting, you know, this, this, it was a point, I guess, you know, where, I mean, you know, kind of the end of history, you know, there are so many possibles. And like you said, Fanon was very aware of uh, many votes that could be taken. And at some point yesterday, Chat said that Fanon p thought of himself on the side, as to be on the side of the winners. He had no doubt that they were going to win. But then what's the future? And when you come you know, to, the, to the conclusion, his conclusion about, you know, what model should formerly colonized countries take? You know, is it the European model or something completely new? And so we had this discussion about, you know, like Fanon, yeah, giving all these propositions and being very, yeah, aware of all of these tensions and what should prevail or not. And being very, I guess, is Marxian, is influences, you know, this thing about yeah, like the national bourgeoisie being a possible pitfall for the um, revolution and for the for what comes after the revolution. And that marks in perspective provided him with relevant insights. But one of the things I admire the most in Fanon was his um, the 
political power of his writing. He wasn't just uh, not even a psychiatrist, he was a literary figure. And when you read the conclusion of The Wretched of the Earth, it's such a compelling political manifesto, perhaps one of the most powerful political texts that were written in the 20th century. And I think that nowadays no one writes that way anymore. It's a type of uh, not just writing, but political imagination that is absent from our contemporary consciousness. Mm -hmm. And maybe this is something to reconsider. Maybe we should, like um, Schatz mentioned towards the end of the event, whether we live in a Fanonian moment or not, maybe we should be living in a Fanonian moment mm -hmm. insofar as to imagine the potential possibilities of future political actions to forge better collective futures. But yeah, no, what you say about him being like a good writer and um, being very a literary figure beyond being um, a psychiatrist says a lot about him, Fanon being a man of his time, was not afraid of leaving his discipline, his silo. Like, you know, because maybe... He writes so well, or maybe let's say he speaks because as Shad said yesterday, he didn't really write the book, but he would speak that and he, he will speak and his secretary would write, um, would, would type. Uh, it says maybe it's this way because also he, he read beyond his discipline. Um, I, I think if I'm not mistaken... In Martinique, when he was in high school, he was taught by Césaire, and he was he was a, he admired Césaire for a long time, and then he took his distance because he did not he, was, he did not agree with all the positions of of Césaire. But you know him not being afraid of go of reading fiction, of reading literary figures, you know, of poets like Césaire or writers like uh, We Shall Write. Schatz mentioned uh, mentioned in the book and also in the event. Uh, that um, he he was very interested in Richard White and in Black American writers in in general, and so it also says a lot. Maybe because today we tend to be in our own silo, because being, for example, for our case, we are trying. We are baby academics trying to be aspiring. <laughs> well, aspiring. Thank you, thank you. That's a better word. Um, so now it's a profession. So if you're a sociologist, you're a sociologist. If you're lawyer or you no know, you're a legal scholar and for example for my case I do tend to borrow a lot of from other disciplines and there's always a pushback saying you know be be focused and maybe at the time they were not that scared of that and they are not scared also of involving themselves in the society because when you write about something you know you have to to live by that, I mean, not to the extreme of Fanon. We don't have to all be <laughs> revolutionaries, as you told me, you know, earlier. But maybe we can leave the ivory tower from time to time. I mean, the, the UI is a university specializing in the social sciences, sciences, and it raises the what you just said raises the problem of whether the social sciences can be separated from the outside world at all. Naturally, we have to apply some methodologies, makes limit our arguments to uh, make our claims uh, academic and scientific. But in the study of society and politics, this element of utopianism even, which was very much present in Fanon's writing, is indispensable to an extent. And I think we have lost something, perhaps, by abandoning this kind of political writing that Fanon was practicing. I mean, when you read the conclusion of The Wretched of the Earth, it's such a powerful political manifesto. It Perhaps it was one of the most powerful political texts ever written in the 20th century. And nowadays, I can barely think of anyone who writes like that. And yet Fanon is a seminal thinker. To, the, mm -hmm. to this day. Yeah, maybe because so we we feel like we have so much to lose. Because, for example, if we take... I'm going to 
talk about myself because maybe that's I'm not going to claim uh, something I'm I, I'm not sure about. But you know, for example, as an aspiring academic, you know, you have to think about the job market afterwards. So you have a discipline, you know, and you have an expertise and all of that. So it I guess sometimes it I'm scared of being very normative in my in my writing for my phases, for example, of saying, you know, what are my propositions? And I guess, like you said, we lost something about Ethiopianism because we tend to maybe be limited in our propositions. And maybe what, for me, what Schatz shows brilliantly in the book uh, is, is, you know, describing this era, which was full of intellectuals, but they were not only, um, they didn't stop from just being, for example, let's say I'm a poet, so I'm just only going to do poetry, or I'm you know, a, a sociologist or a philosopher, and I'm only going to do that. They were not scared of the politics, of the political, you know, which can be messy. Politics can be messy. So it's much more convenient to, for example, make it to be like, oh, no, I'm doing academic writing and that's it, you know, take my distance. But in doing that, of course, we produce academically sound, you know, pieces. But in the, for maybe we lose something in our writing to be like, you no know, very, um, yeah, relevant for the times and, you know, very impactful. So, you know, there's this tension and I guess we all make our choices. But maybe, yeah, the people of the time of Fanon uh, did a better job at that. It was messy. It was risky. But, you know, it gave results. I'm thinking about the fact that, you know, like Fanon's first book, Black Skin's White Mask, was his thesis, which was rejected. But now, look, it's, it became such a classic. And maybe if it had, you know, complied with what the university wanted of him and, you know, produced a, a, a good thesis, but then, you know, who, who would have read that? So it also bears to, to mind these questions. We talked a lot about the fact that Fanon was in many ways a, a visionary and that is still very relevant today, but it would not give an accurate um, depiction of a book if we just talk about that, because Schatz also does a good job. Exactly, of and about... he mentioned during yeah. the talk that he didn't write a uh, geography. Mm -hmm. It was in many ways a critical account of Fanon's uh, ideas and politics. And what I found particularly interesting during the event was when Nadia Marzuki mentioned his uh, Fanon's relation to Islam. Mm -hmm. And the way she tied it to him being, you know, an outsider, because he wants to belong, you know, and he really puts himself, you know, in this fight, in this struggle when he's not Algerian by birth. But then she accurately mentions the fact that he relied on translators. He didn't speak Arabic. He didn't really try to speak, to, to learn. Let's listen from Nadia Marzuki in the live event. There was an impossibility of Algeria for Fanon um, in the sense that he comes across as, as that, that someone who desperately wants to, to love, to be Algerian, to, to be an insider. Yet he remains always that outsider, he doesn't speak Arabic or Berber. He doesn't even try to learn. You say he relies on interpreters for his work. Um, and you mentioned uh, a number of times situations where uh, his FLN comrades, you know, are very proud of, of him and love him. And yet they, they say, well, I mean, he's still not one of, the, one of, one of us. And then he goes to, to Tunis and, and, and then to, to to uh, Sub-Saharan Africa, so so he, there's this this insider outsider positionality um, that's that's um, that that's intriguing and um, related to that. Uh, I, I was really struck uh, with the the blind spot of Islam in his thinking and uh, his his relationship to Islam. His approach to Islam is a sort of basic Marxian false consciousness or an, um, a factor of resistance when he looks at the unveiling of, of women. And in his exchange with Shariati that you, that you mentioned, he says very clearly that he doesn't believe in Islam as, a, as an important factor. And, you know, at the end of the day, he was still an outsider. And 
he really underestimated the importance of Islam. And like you said, Professor Marzuki um, said that, you know, it, in the post-independence in Algeria, you know, in the way that he thought Algeria would become, you know, he, he thought of Algeria as this model for all formerly colonized mm -hmm. countries. And he didn't really... That was not the reality at the end because maybe he had underestimated the importance of culture and of Islam. And I think this is an important uh, problem in left-wing Marxian thought of that era, that it pretty much treats uh, culture and the existing social norms as customs as something dispensable, mm -hmm. something that could be overridden during uh, the revolutionary moment. And this is an assumption that Fanon himself, I think, did in The Wretched of the Earth when he cre creates these um, visions of a fu collective future of Africa, free of European imperialism. I, I'm not sure if it's Marxian or not, but it's certainly a view of religion which assumes I think a kind of modernist linear narrative that eventually this kind of relig this this um, this um, religious politics will um, will wane, um, and I think this is one reason why Fanon was so attractive to a radical leftist sort of third tier mondiste readership, because you know, it made the Algerian revolution look like a modernist struggle. But he doesn't really consider what the existing reality in Algeria and other places consisted of at that time. And I think this is uh, relevant for left-wing anti-colonial thought mm. even nowadays. And Fanon could be a good starting point to discuss that. Yeah, and also the, in my, in my, um, from what I remember, he also romanticizes the peasantry. And I think Schatz mentions that in the book, right? The role of a peasantry in the revolution. And, you know, I guess sometimes, you know, in utopian idealist writing, we tend to overestimate some things, underestimate some things, and then without taking into account, like you said, you know, the reality, and it gives an inaccurate account and maybe some things that we miss in that. And I guess that's one of the shortcomings of Fanon's writing. Yes, revolutions are always built on something. They are never made in a void. Mm -hmm. And another aspect that uh, Fanon, well, maybe not underestimated, but has been criticized for, is his emphasis on the role of violence. And this is uh, the classic accusation, conservative accusation against Fanon, made by Anna Arendt in her excellent essay on violence, wrote, mm -hmm. I think, in 1968 or uh, 69 in which uh, Arendt emphasizes that true power resides not in violence, it resides in collective creative action. Uh, but a recent scholarship, for instance, by Samuel Moyne in his book, uh, Liberalism Against Itself, uh, proves that Arendt was uh, talking about a uh, democratic republic, mm -hmm. which were not the conditions Fanon mm -hmm. lived in and did his politics in. And so I think this is a relevant aspect uh, for consideration of his ideas nowadays. So Fanon, I think, you know, helps us to think about violence. Um, he's not, I mean, it's, it's true that Fanon was a, was an advocate of armed struggle, we can talk about that, but he's also someone who's thinking about the psychological dynamics of violence. And um, that was one of the reasons why I found his work to be so stimulating with respect to, to Israel-Palestine. Yeah, when it comes to violence, my impression is that in uh, mainstream classic Western uh, academia and thinking, Fanon tends to be misinterpreted. I don't, I don't consider, I mean, I don't understand Fanon as being, as romanticizing violence. He was a psychiatrist and, you know, even in The Wretched of the Earth and in Blaskin's White Mask, you, you can see there's a big importance given to the impact of colonialism on violence on both the colonized and the colonizer. So I don't think he romanticized that at all, but he saw it as a means to an end. It was very pragmatic. And like you said, when in his 
in the way he thought about, he gave a lot of space to what comes after the revolution, you know, the aftermath. And when you look at, you read, you read the conclusion, you understand that he's not romanticizing that at all. And I think he's misunderstood because also, you know, of Sartre's uh, preface, because I think lots of people have read Sartre's preface and not actually taking or the time to read. Or have read Fanon through Sartre. Yes, exactly. Which is a uh, misunderstanding. But... Well, those who would criticize Fanon for his uh, recognition of violence as a political tool, the question related to that is how can you dismantle colonialism via other means? Yeah, because I, Fanon has this quote where he says that, you know, colonialism is a violent phenomenon and it never essentializes people. Like, you know, you, for Fanon, you, when you know in the last chapter it, where it gives you know the account psychiatric accounts of both people who are tortured and torturers they are human beings also so you understand that violence also impacts the people who are doing the violence and that being victimized doesn't make you a noble person per se you know it's not because you've been victimized that you know you're going to be noble after that and take the noble route but it also does something to you. So I think that's also something in Fanon's writing, and that can be also accurate for today, you know, that victims can become perpetrators. And in his in the way he thought about the after after the independence, after the revolution, it's something that he really takes into account. So I think that's even a reason why that's why he's not per se a writer on violence. It's a very pragmatic writer. It's about what you know what comes out of the independence what type of society you want to but it's a process to get to that to liberate yourself maybe you have to exactly. to use violence but then you can, it's not a permanent state right political i well political actions can uh, have shortcomings and pitfalls mm -hmm. but it doesn't mean we should abandon political thinking altogether mm -hmm. exactly you know like the conclusion of Black skins, white, uh, white marks, that uh, shots, you know, reminded us of at the talk. I think it was his conclusion. You know, this uh, co famous quote by Fanon was like, it does all my make of me someone who always questions or something like that. I don't have a, the accurate quote. I have it on my laptop. <laughs> but, um, so I think that's a, that's a good way also of wrapping up, you know, of what we learned about Fanon and, you know, we was was someone who always questioned, you know, not easy answers. And I think that's what we can take from him. I think that's an enduring lesson of fun. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Not just to seek easy answers, yes. but ask difficult questions. And this the quote is... I think is, oh my body, make of me always a man who questions or something. Precisely. Like I think it went like this. Yes. <laughs> the last line of black skin, white masks is, oh my body, make of me always a man who questions. Thank you for joining us in today's episode of EY Conversations, the podcast. Follow us on Spotify, SoundCloud, or YouTube and stay tuned for upcoming episodes.